defensibility. We talk about virality, but retention is key. Even more key is how you tell a story. Beginning, middle, end on your way to glory. Who will buy you and for how much? Are you a person with that personal touch? Peter Saddington, your big game hunter. And guys, we have our sights on someone special <laughs> no, today. Only a mother could invest in this idea. made <laughs> this, <laughs> like super artistic. <laughs> that is actually absolutely correct. Um, and that's a very, very astute assessment, actually. True startup story, guys. You got it. Your company just got seed round financed. Congratulations. You're going to the moon. But now you have to scale. You found great talent out in California, New York, Georgia, and even Eastern Europe. So what communications platform will you be using to ensure your international team is always aligned? Well, the answer is easy. Slack.com for teams. We've used Slack for all of our previous startups and they've supported us in tremendous ways. And we want to give them a thanks today for supporting vchunting.com. Did you also know that Slack is a great tool for personal use? Yeah, I use my own personal Slack channel to drop in documents, notes, to-dos, and follow-ups to ensure that my workflow throughout the day is right on course. I promise you, if you try out slack.com for personal use, you'll end up using it for your team as well. Go to slack.com to check it out. Welcome everybody to season three of VC Hunting. You guys know we're always on the hunt for some great untold stories of venture capitalists. And guys, I have someone halfway across the world, a wonderful guest. It's Max Marine, who is the principal of Lul Ventures. Max, thanks so much for joining the show. Hey, Peter. Thanks so much for having me. Well, let's just get into this and give us a little bit of context, Max. How did you get into venture capital and what brings you to this point today? Wow. So uh, I hope you guys have three hours. Uh, <laughs> no, I'll try to make it, I'll try to make it brief. Um, so yeah, basically, you know, I went to school uh, for finance and real estate. Thought I was going to go into real estate. Um, my uncle was in real estate. It just seemed like the the path for me. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have an internship in college at a public pension fund where basically mm. I was analyzing all these different asset classes, fixed income, equity, real estate, uh, private equity, and then the small slice of the pie, uh, venture capital. <clears throat> and I just thought, you know, that I, I didn't know what venture capital was at the time. Mm. Um, but I thought, you know, a career where you're actually helping people versus just helping properties uh, appreciate in value uh, seemed a little bit more aligned with my personality. I guess I'm a, a people person at heart. Um, and so, you know, I started to explore the, the industry that was back, back in school. I ended up spending a year in Israel uh, as a volunteer after right. college. Um, <clears throat> most of the time I was in the periphery teaching English, but towards the end of the, the year I actually was uh, living and interning in Tel Aviv. Now, I don't know if you've been to Tel Aviv. No, I haven't. I'd love to visit. Um, nice. So maybe after this conversation, you'll feel inspired. <laughs> um, but basically, it's a, it's a hub. It's, a, it's an ecosystem. It's uh, got some characteristics that are similar of Silicon Valley. Um, innovation, entrepreneurship, you know, lots of R&D, lots of great universities. And I basically understood in that you know, month and a half of interning, I have to live here for at least a year um, in, in my 20s. So I sort of put that in the back burner, got a master's in investment management. Uh, and after school, I joined a consulting firm that basically focused on helping Israeli startups commercialize successfully in, in the U.S. Um, and so a few months into that, I was based in Philadelphia, right, right near my hometown. Uh, I asked my, my boss, uh, the partner of the firm, if I could relocate to Tel Aviv. So this is like five and a half years ago. Wow. Um, and at first it was like, you know, you've only been working here like a month. <laughs> you know, it takes a bit of chutzpah as they say, but yeah. um, eventually, you know, he, he saw the value and uh, he relocated me here. And I sort of came, you know, with two suitcases, uh, no real friends, definitely no family, uh, just a job and, you know, the, the desire to, to experience Tel Aviv. Um, and as I, you know, spent that first year here, met a lot of different people. And one of my clients was actually an equity crowdfunding platform called uh, iAngels. 
Uh, oh. It's sort of like funders club model, but uh, for Israel. And about a year in, in this consulting gig, I actually had a really strong relationship with uh, one of the partners at, at iAngels that mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, led to uh, an opportunity to join their investment team. So that was a little, that was about four years ago. Um, so that's the, the short one, short version. Um, hopefully well, that, that covered the, the, the story of how I got in. Um, and yeah, sorry, did you? Uh, no, I was, just, I, was, I, was just, I was just gonna say, I mean, your boss couldn't have been, your previous boss couldn't have been that dense. I mean, it is, they're obviously, you know, a young blood, a young buck asking to be relocated to another country, in this case, Israel. I mean, he couldn't have been that dense. I mean, shouldn't he have assumed that you were gonna eventually find a different job or a different opportunity? Well, what do you think that, that thought process was like for him? Um, well, <laughs> Come on. You know, I, I think the, the plan was to ultimately uh, expand the practice in Israel and mm -hmm. eventually raise a fund around the, the consulting practice. Um, but, you know, after a year of sort of, you know, meeting people and understanding things, I guess I was younger and less patient and saw an opportunity and, you know, fundraising takes 18 months and mm -hmm. I was just ready to, to start, you know, getting my feet, feet wet. Um, so sort of jump ship and that was, yeah, that was four years ago. And a year and a half later, uh, I met my current, uh, fund Lul, um, and sort of, uh, joined them as an analyst and have had a, a nice run, I guess, over the, the last couple of years. Um, and really have enjoyed, uh, you know, all the different aspects of, of working for Lul. So that sort of brings us to, to the present. Absolutely. And so you say that you're a people person. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering, you could be a people person anywhere in San Francisco, New York, Austin, Colorado, Atlanta, other startup hubs, these types right. of things. And so what specifically attracted you to Israel? Was it, was it the ladies? <laughs> I see you repped Atlanta there. You snuck in at the end. It's, uh, it's good, good for you. I caught it. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I mean, uh, partly ladies, partly uh, innovation. Uh, you know, Israel's been uh, called the startup nation mm. uh, for over a decade. I actually, you know, produced a rap music video about it with some friends just because there's so much innovation here. It's nuts. Um, we're going to talk about that for sure. We'll get there. But, you know, eventually after spending a few months here, um, I actually, <laughs> so I used to work for a family office. I, I asked my, you know, family office uh, par partner, like if I could just basically represent him while I was in Tel Aviv and scout for investment. So, you know, I was just meeting entrepreneur after entrepreneur after entrepreneur and listening to them talk about their dreams and the, the future and, and all these different software products. And I was just blown away, you know, sort of just the energy, you know, you, you either feel it or you don't. Mm. I felt it. And I also felt like as an American who has English as a native language, which in Israel is a huge asset uh, for many startups that, you know, it's not their native language. It's much harder. Uh, mm. The things that we take for granted, just, you know, writing emails in a certain way or just, you know, sentence structure and grammar, things that um, are very natural for us. I think, you know, many startups over here, uh, it's not as uh, intuitive. So that was one observation. Mm. Also just, you know, having the culture, it's a very different culture over here in Israel. People yell at each other and they, they do it out of love and they don't really sugarcoat the truth. There's no political correctness, although there's been a lot of Americans coming into the system. So maybe that's changing a little bit, but not really. Um, and so, you know, just understanding that I as an American in Israel in this tech hub could potentially have, you know, let's say unique value to the ecosystem where in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley, if you, you know, are American, you're not unique, you know, you're just yeah. part of, you know, the, 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 um, the standard. So really, I think in life, we're always looking for what's our angle, how are we different, you know, how can we compete in, a, you know, a crowded market. And so, you know, seeing the opportunity to really help uh, be a bridge between the Israeli market and, and the U.S. market captured my my interests. Uh, and then, yeah, the ladies also. So. <laughs> well, now, this is my turn to quip at you. I'm glad that you added the ladies in at the end. I, ca I caught that. <laughs> and so you said that you were near your hometown in Philly. Are you a, uh, were you a born and raised uh, northerner? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Because I, yeah, I, I, I was born right outside uh, Philadelphia in, in the Burbs. 
In the burbs. Okay. Well, I know the area quite well because I was born in, uh, not born, I was born in Korea, but I was raised in uh, New Jersey, West Windsor, Plainsboro, Princeton Junction. Cool. So um, a Philadelphia Eagles fan through and through. <laughs> as, yeah. a, and for, as unfortunate as that may sound. <laughs> Go birds. Go birds. <laughs> Go birds, go birds. So uh, you go, no, we'll save that for the credits. Yes, it sounds perfect. I love it. So let's get into where you are today. You're at Lul Ventures, which is like cool, but L O O L L O O L Lul yeah. Ventures. Tell me, what attracted you to them? Tell us about the the genesis and maybe the history of it. Did you did you meet them at a at a, at a startup event or a conference or a meetup? How did this come about? And and what what captured your heart to join Lul Ventures, um, and and be part of their team today? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a another three hour story, but again, I'll, I'll bring it I'll down let, to the yeah, tell the, us your best story, bro. The brief. So. Um, the, the, the funny story is that when I was working for this consulting firm, I actually was working with several clients that uh, are actually still Lul, Lul portfolio companies. So at the time, I was actually working on behalf of Lul even before I knew Lul was really a fund or, or even existed. So that was one funny thing. Then when I was actually interning in Tel Aviv, I you know, I was trying to get a job at the same time so I could stick around and ultimately it didn't converge in, in time, but I started sending emails to different VCs, like just, you know, cold emails trying to get meetings. So I sent them to probably a handful. And, you know, after joining Lou, I looked back at my, my inbox and I had sent an email to Yaniv, one of the partners, basically like, hi, my name is Max. I have a few interesting ideas to help you guys fundraise. Call me. And I just, that was my one liner. He obviously never called, but I, I brought that up in a, in a meeting, you know, four or five years later and we all had a good laugh. Um, Does he even think, remember the email or are you just part of the spam? Vaguely, vaguely, remember, vaguely remembers looking at it and thinking like, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> but, but that was, you know, just sort of, I guess the, um, some signs along the way. Then, you know, I was working for iAngels. iAngels is, uh, at least at the time, was more of a co-investment platform. So not mm. negotiating, not setting terms, not leading rounds, more uh, co-investing. That's since evolved. But at the time, I sort of saw you know, that as a nice stepping stone, but really wanted to learn what it was like in the driver's seat, basically like driving the, the deal from the start and, and closing it. Um, so I started to explore other opportunities. As you know, in the VC world, you know, networking is part of the, the job description. Uh, so I had met the, uh, the associate several times just over coffee for lunch, you know, building sort of a, a relationship with her. And then ultimately, as I was starting to think about uh, exploring other opportunities, she, you know, basically pulled me into a process that, um, you know, ended up uh, being fruitful and, and, you know, spending some time with the partners and getting to know their backgrounds and their philosophy uh, ultimately led me to, you know, sign on the dotted line. Mm. Um, and I think that answered your question, but was there another part about who Lul is or remind well, me if... Yeah. No, 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 that, that's, that's perfect. Did you know that there's even more value than just audio or video? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, at VC Hunting, and make sure to sign up for the VC Hunting newsletter where you'll be able to get weekly news on venture capital, startups, founder stories, and the occasional wisdom extracted from Peter's brain. Go to vchunting.com to sign up. And now back to the episode. It, what, what is interesting is, is uh, what I really appreciated about Lul Ventures uh, on the website is it clearly outlines right, your thesis, what you're all about, focusing on, on um, early stage uh, vent venture opportunities. But I really liked the kind of the FAQ of what is Lul, right? Lul is a Hebrew word meaning hatchery or a place where something is born and raised. And so that kind of ethos of Lul is that you, it's very the only word that I could come up with is Lul seems to me very homey. Like 
when you're when you're you're joining this family that's willing to walk with you and crawl with you and help you grow is is that is am i on the on the right track there because it was hard for me to 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 look beyond the the whole chicken coop thing <laughs> i'll be honest with you maybe it's cuz i'm an american and i was i was thinking about chicken coop like that's a messy business but startups is a messy bi- messy business yeah. tell us about the culture of lol and and what uh, what what's about that culture that keeps you there and has attracted you to it yeah yeah okay so we're trying to shed the uh, the chicken coop image. <laughs> We've been trying to shed that for years, but I like how you actually uh, described it. It was better than we're doing at describing it. So, um, you know, basically the the uh, the the brand as we now sort of present it is more that it looks like one zero zero one, which is binary code, which yes. is digital, which is you know, what we're all about, basically investing in the ones and zeros that power everything around us. Um, At the same time, you know, this idea of taking something from its embryonic stage uh, all the way to, you know, basically maturity is a nice metaphor analogy for, you know, what what the venture business is all about. Um, I think what I really like about Lul is A, autonomy. So there's some places that, you know, there's a bit more, micromanaging and sort of looking Mm. over your shoulder and, you know, being a bit um, more, yeah, just managerial. And and here it's basically like you're part of the team. You need to figure out where you contribute the most value and we trust that your judgment is sound and Mm. we give you basically, you know, that ability to go and and figure out what needs to be done. And and that has been really empowering. Uh, And it's really allowed me to do many things I would say that are not traditional uh, of, of VCs uh, that are not partners in, in Israel. Um, and I also, you know, I think it's a really <clears throat> collaborative environment. So there's no partner leading this deal and partner leading that deal. And, you know, this is my company and this is your company. It's very much a team effort on everything we do um, from investing to supporting the portfolio. Um, also that the two partners are, brilliant, I would say, um, you know, very smart and sharp and have uh, experience that, um, you know, is, is really unique, in, at least in Israel, there's not many funds that were started by uh, serial entrepreneurs who built and sold several companies, mm-hmm. uh, and then worked for corporates as investors, as well as angels. So uh, they've been able to see it from a lot of different angles. And I really appreciate uh, the perspective that they bring uh, to both, you know, investing and, and supporting companies. Um, I think those are the, you know, the, the main aspects. Um, and you know, it's just, it's a good culture. Like I really look forward to, you know, coming to the office and spending time with the partners and I'm able to actually, (laughs) you know, express myself creatively, uh, which I think is a huge part of it. And they actually like some of my jokes. (laughs) So I'm able to express my sense of humor as well. Uh, so yeah. Well, one thing that you didn't say about your, the two co-founders of the fund, uh, the GPs is that they're willing. Clearly, they are very willing participants because I've seen them in two of your music videos. So let's pivot a little bit and let's talk about these music videos, which, by the way, in my opinion, I don't understand why they haven't gone viral. It must be because venture capitalists are, are insecure with, with promoting other VCs. Maybe that's it. Uh, but holy cow, let's pivot a little bit. You created some music videos. Mm-hmm. The first music video is, so you want to raise a seed. And the second one is startup nation. Mm-hmm. How the hell did you convince what I would assume to be a relatively conservative culture? Yeah. Uh, bleeding itself into venture capital, corporate culture. How did you convince them to do a music video and a music video where they're obviously participating, number one, but number two, you have your shirt off. This is very anti-PC, very, very anti-VC. <laughs> I was <laughs> hoping you wouldn't say that, but you did, so you I did can't it. avoid it. You, you yeah. now no longer have a choice. It's, it's online forever. You with your I shirt off. I have chest hair. You know, I'm not, not afraid to show it. So. <laughs> so um, how did you convince them? Tell us the story. Sure. So, you know, it, it goes back to uh, college, actually. I was in marketing uh, 101 and I was sort of not feeling the, the studying. I was really just not memorizing successfully all of the you know, material. So what I did was I had a rap to actually memorize sort of like as a mnemonic uh, to remember the content. 
And then the next day in class, I, I asked the teacher if she would let me present it to the class, uh, which was, I don't know, just something me wanting to express myself, I guess. She <laughs> obviously said, sure. I performed it and she, she liked it so much that she said, instead of doing a final exam for the class, do a final project and create a rap video about the Fox School of Business at Temple University where I went to school. So oh. the OG, the original OG. Like, uh, rap video of mine is actually uh, a rap video about the Fox School of Business. It's, it's still online. I can send you a link after, uh, after the show. That was, you know, very rough. <laughs> um, the, the audio, the video, it was 10 years ago, so go figure. But uh, I was basically in, you know, this monthly deal flow meeting with the partners where we discuss strategy and how we, you know, basically get in front of the right entrepreneurs at the right time. Uh, and I said, look, you know, check this out. I showed them the video. They were, you know, kind of laughing out loud. Uh, and I basically then said, I think this would be a cool format to, you know, basically create something about venture. And, and at the time I really didn't know what that would look like. So they gave me the, you know, yellow light, let's call it. So the, I don't think they knew it was coming, but they <laughs> said, basically, you know, tread carefully, but we give you the, the green light. Um, or the, the other light, whatever. So I started thinking, what is a good topic to, to really rap about? And it coincided with me writing uh, an ebook mm -hmm. called Raising Your Seed Round, a playbook for Israeli entrepreneurs. And as I was writing it and thinking about it, I said, you know, this kind of is a topic that I know a lot about. Why don't I try to bring it, you know, into a three minute rap video and, and see what that, see what happens. So I basically wrote the rap. I performed it for them. Uh, and they said, yeah, we, we like it. You should, you should move forward with it. And so again, I had no idea what it would look like. Um, I had no idea what it would turn out to be. Uh, but I actually worked with, uh, one of my best friends who was in, you know, sort of an up and coming videographer an editor, uh, to create the footage. And then, you know, after creating the master scenes of me, uh, and showing some of the footage to the partners, you know, we all agreed that we needed to have all of Lul in it. You know, it was like a group effort, right? Because that's who we are. We're a team. It's not just Max. It's mm. not just Avichai. So, you know, some of, the, some of the footage, I don't think they expected, you know, would look like that. But I actually think, you know, it really uh, shows Lul in, in a positive light because it's really about taking risk in this business, right? And mm. so, you know, sort of taking the risk of putting something out there that's different and not... Uh, not common, I think also uh, embodies sort of what Lul is all about. Um, and, you know, it didn't go viral, viral. It went Israel viral in certain communities. It was going viral. But ultimately, you know, uh, the Facebook YouTube split right now is just crushing video virality. I'm sure you're familiar with it because you're producing sure. on YouTube and Facebook, you know, it's not really a video platform, but things spread much faster because it's social, whereas YouTube, you know, you basically have a video only platform, but it's crowded. And how do you get the social spread? So exactly. we can talk about that, that offline or online <laughs> if we have time. Um, but basically that video allowed me to uh, think even bigger and think, mm -hmm. you know, what else can I rap about that I'm passionate about that, you know, maybe the world needs to hear this message and they're too impatient to read a book or to, you know, read a blog post. Maybe this is the new format for uh, communication um, that, you know, is really shareable and accessible in an easy digestible way. So um, that led to me writing this Startup Nation rap. Now, I knew it was going to be a, a bigger production just because the topic, you know, needed to cover much more locations, much more, um, you know, scenes, many more different things. And I went to an NGO in Israel called Startup Nation Central, uh -huh. whose mission is very much aligned with my, my own to build this bridge between, you know, Israel and the rest of the international community. Uh, and my, <laughs> my pitch for sponsorship was me rapping live to the general manager there. And he had never met me before. I mean, it was literally five minutes into our conversation that I was then rapping. And I told him what I needed to make the video. We shook hands and that was it. I mean, it was the craziest uh, deal I've ever made. <laughs> um, oh, there, and, wasn't, there uh, wasn't any Simon Cowell. You, sir, suck. <laughs> it was just thank, a thankfully, Simon Cowell was, uh, was uh, 
not in the building um, because he would have been harsh, I'm sure. But, um, you know, that led to basically what, you know, is now now on YouTube and and Facebook, the the Startup Nation rap video. Um, And along the way, I've actually been working on a series of climate related raps that are, you know, basically uh, to increase awareness of different issues that we're facing, you know, as a species on on the planet, uh, but also a new uh, VC related rap called founder friendly. Um, and I got the partners buy-in for that. So, uh, the, the, the virality coefficient on this one, I think might be higher mostly because I'm weaving in Silicon Valley brands into the lyrics. So maybe the fact that they're in it will make them more likely to share it. We'll see. I'm not, well, fingers crossed, but no. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm going to do my best because this is internationally syndicated. So I'm gonna do my best to make sure that we 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 syndicate it. We get the message out there. When is it going to be released? So, I wish I could give you a, a hard a hard date. The issue is that I'm still recruiting one VC in Israel to be in the video and. Believe it or not, it's been harder than I would have imagined to get the right person uh, to be in, in the, the Tel Aviv. So basically, it's, it's half in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, half in Tel Aviv. I already shot all of the Silicon Valley scenes with a VC friend out mm. there. I'm looking for a parallel storyline, basically, in, in Tel Aviv. So I'm looking for the right person. It's still, uh, I got some disappointing well, news today. I waited a couple of weeks. Not going to not gonna get this one. Hopefully, I'll come up with a, a good alternative. Um, so I would hopefully say, you know, April, April, early April would be the, the target, but don't hold me to it. Well, you got a little bit of confirmation bias and some survivorship bias because, I mean, you, the stories you're telling me, I know you're not telling the full story, but it seemed pretty easy to slide into to Lul and convince your, your GPs there and then slide in and have a conversation. And everyone's like, rap? Sure, why not? I think you're finally facing the reality of when people think of rap. It's like, let's see, this guy, he doesn't look like a rapper. He doesn't sound like a rapper when he's talking to me. So what is this all about? And that actually, that actually had, I had a question because like this video revealed to me a side, an unusual side of your personality. Mm-hmm. Clearly, this is not something that I think the general population or anyone that meets you would assume that you can rap. That's so, right. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Very right, right. Yeah, right, right. And, and so you, you said that you started this in high school. Did, were you good at, at rapping in high school? Or was this just one of those like, you know what, I just want to present it through a rap, a, a rap thing. Like, where did this come from? Where did, was, is this something that you got from your granddaddy or your, or your mama? Where is mm, it from? Good question. Um, so my mom actually I mean, wrote... I think you could, I mean, for, for a personality like you, and the fact that you can go on and do a rap video. I mean, you're this close to being a really successful comedian. Like, have you ever thought about <laughs> doing stand up or being the VC comedy guy? Uh, I've thought about it, but I don't know. I watch stand up comedians and they tap into things that I just don't, I'm not quite there yet. I might get there someday. Like, my sense of humor is much more Larry David, Jerry Seinfeld, uh, um, less like Louis C.K., Bill Burr. And I, see. I think. I have some observational humor, but I haven't figured out how to del- deliver it yet. So I'm focused on, I guess, rap in the meantime. Maybe, maybe comedy will come later. Um, I am very funny. <laughs> I know. See? I know. Um, well, anyways. If you say Jerry Seinfeld, I mean, Jerry Seinfeld made millions and millions of dollars t- talking about absolutely nothing. And so in many ways, here's a joke. Uh, VCs spend lots and lots of time and money talking about absolutely nothing. So <laughs> there you go. There's, there's I know, here. like, look at us, right? We're, what are we talking about here? I have no um, idea. We're talking, okay. we're, we're learning the untold stories. And so these rap videos, these rap videos, I just, I, I watched them several times. I, I especially, you know, the ones with uh, your shirt off. I think that was, <laughs> that was a, there you go. Um, and so how do you, th- how do you think, let, let's, let's talk about this for a second, because you brought it up. Do you think at venture capitalists, because let's just look at the broad swath of VC funds out there today. Not many of them are on YouTube. Certainly not many of them are doing video or even podcast. Now, podcast is growing. It's kind of in vogue right now. It's, uh, Everyone has a podcast, right? Yeah, it's the half, half-ass version of a venture capitalist saying, you know, I kind of want to stay still, still stay relevant, so let me make a podcast. Um, right. 
but what is your opinion on venture funds and the future of mobile first and video first? Do you think venture funds are uh, behind the curve when it comes to be going on video and doing more content uh, production? Yeah, I think generally uh, they are. I do think there are some funds that have been producing really high quality content for uh, at least, you know, the last five years. And Dreesen being one of them, for first sure. round being another, uh, Red Point being a third. Um, I think in Israel, it's less of a content is less of a core competency. Mm -hmm. um, so I think VCs do it, but they don't have, you know, like a production studio or a team uh, that's basically focused on content like you see in some of these marquee brands. Mm. Um, so I think there's, you know, definitely room to, to grow. I mean, I always think about it for my portfolio companies, you know, how, um, how are they doing on, on content marketing and, and how is that driving leads or, you know, driving conversions or, or awareness? Um, I don't think that the VC industry historically has had the same uh, sort of uh, dynamics. Um, it's been much more hey, you know, you come to us and we get to decide. And I think that's the real shift that's happening where, um, too, you know, we might see a shakeout in the next couple of years because um, it, it does seem like there's a bit of an oversupply of capital and an undersupply of quality assets. Hmm. Um, but, you know, for the time being, you, you really need to uh, differentiate. And basically, I think Josh Koppelman wrote something pretty salient about this or, or spoke about this where, um, you know, when he first started out, there were maybe six seed funds that were, you know, really not, no, well known. And it's like you walk into a shoe store and you see six shoes. Um, you know, you can actually inspect each one, try one, try each one on and choose the one you like the best. Today's venture world looks more like a footlocker where you have a thousand shoes mm. um, and you basically need to have proxies uh, to understand, you know, which ones to try on. So um, I think that's happening more and more. And, you know, basically the human mind is all about mental models, heuristics, shortcuts, you know, ways to be efficient in making decisions. And so if you find that one brand is consistently producing high quality information uh, or content that resonates with you as, as a founder, um, not only might you be more likely to approach them first, all things held equal, obviously. I mean, if you're a terrible sure. fund with great content, it's not really going to move the needle. Um, but all things held equal, uh, I think, you know, basically it's, it's becoming a, a competitive advantage to have really, really high quality content, if that answers your question. No, I love it. And, I, and I, be, I believe that's actually where VC is going to end up shifting. I believe that VCs have been suckling on the teat for way too long and it's way too easy to get deal flow. It's fascinating how many uh, venture capitalists I've talked to when I've asked them about the issue of deal flow. They, some of them have come back and said, oh, we don't have issues. There's too much. And then, then I usually respond quickly back with, that's easy because in a capital asset class like venture capital, supply supply dri drives the market, not demand. And so we're overcapitalized and the commoditization of money has made it easy. But I think the world is shifting. And I think it's going to be harder for venture capitalists to create differentiation because there's so many because it's been commoditized. So I think content, at least in my opinion, my hypothesis is content is going to be king for the VC world in the next decade. Would you agree? Or do you have any comments on my hypothesis? I don't know if it will be king. Um, I think it'll be maybe Prince. Uh, I still think the, you know, the, the reputation uh, is probably king. Um, for example, the, you know, the tier one brands, Sequoia Benchmark, Battery Bessemer, you know, so on and so forth. Um, they may lose a deal here and a deal there because they weren't doing content well. Um, but I think they've established such um, significant franchise value that that will remain, um, you know, a defining sort of advantage over the next decade. Um, and even if they don't produce a single piece of content, I think they'll still be okay. I think when you get to basically the next uh, tier down, which is less established franchises mm -hmm. that build, you know, their identity and, and build that place in the founder's mind as, as premium, 
uh, that's where it's going to get super interesting. And maybe there it's going to be more of a king. Um, but yeah, I still think reputation is going to trump. And I don't think they're completely separate. Like, you know, basically you build a reputation as well by helping, you know, founders and some of that help can be, you know, through inform informative content, educational content, events, webinars, podcasts, whatever it is. Um, so I think it, it's connected. I agree. I, I, I appreciate your dissection of it. I think when it comes to the established brands, yes, they're going to continue to have the advantages uh, afforded to them through the hard work and effort of years and decades of work. Uh, but we, but I think it's also fair to, and I think it's also fair to say that they're not going to last forever because there's cycles to these things. And it's hard, it's hard to have a, 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 a company that lasts hundred, 200, 300 years, but do I really give a shit? We're going to be dead by then. Uh, so are we, Ooh, that, 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 that right there is a, is an intriguing question. Well, uh, let's, we're, we're getting to the tail end here. And so I want to ask you uh, a, another question here. Do you think that in, in your estimation that those, those videos that you created, the rap videos of uh, you want to be, raise a seed in startup nation, did they move the needle for Lul or, or, or was it just an opportunity to exercise your creative personality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, you know, in short, they moved the needle um, because they shifted their perception of Lul in the market mm. um, as just another fund to a fund that's willing to basically put their neck out and, and try something new. A fun and fund. A fun fund, exactly. <laughs> so um, I think it moved the needle. I'll also comment that... Um, no, I would say one out of every two entrepreneurs that I have engaged with since will comment uh, either on the phone or in person or via email. We actually got an email from an entrepreneur uh, or from a VC that got an email from an entrepreneur basically saying, can you introduce us to Lul? They have one thing no other VC has, a rap video. So that was, you know, ego uh, felt good, but you know, it's just one. Um, and I think the the more nuanced answer is that it's actually part of a longer term brand building strategy. Mm. First and foremost for myself, you know, to be completely honest, but um, also for Google. And so, you know, basically having a couple of these videos out and having done um, uh, okay, uh, pretty well, um, that now I think allows me to continue to produce these types of videos on a variety of topics that uh, can move the needle more each time. So, you know, you at the beginning of your podcast probably had, you know, one or two followers. And then by the fifth video, whatever, a hundred. And now I don't know what, you know, number you're on, but you have thousands. So uh, it's part of a longer story that I think at this point, still a bit premature. That being said, I have been, you know, pretty pleased with, uh, with, the, with the feedback so far. I'm telling you, the I don't know if the venture capital world needs it. It's, maybe it's like this is a kind of like a Batman moment, uh, you know, because Batman is not right the hero we need, but it's kind of the hero we deserve. And with all of these <laughs> parody accounts that are coming out, right? VC brags, uh, uh, VCs congratulating themselves. Dude, that's I mean, a funny one. We, yeah, we, we kind of don't need a VC comedian, but we kind of deserve one. And so I'm one. I'm wondering if you might be that guy. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll definitely take the rapper VC uh, moniker. Emblem. Yeah, we'll take moniker. that. Exactly. And, uh, you know, stay tuned. Let's, let's call it for, uh, for the comedy. <sighs> Perfect. Last question on a medium post on December 8th, uh, 2017. And I bring this up is because I've seen that you, you've been open and transparent about different issues like climate issues, right? These types of things. Um, and on, on your medium post, December 8th, 2017, you, it was, uh, the title was called why crypto billionaires should share the love and taking a quote from there, you said, it's not just in the ethical interest of the wealthiest cryptos to give to charity, but it is in their best financial interest. Now this was back in 2017 during the bull run of crypto and Bitcoin. Right. Has your opinion changed here? Help us unpack that idea because I'm sure there are a lot of people who would say, Hey, I'm a crypto billionaire. Why do I need to share? Unpack that for us. 
I think you're one of the 17 people who have read that article, so I'm very impressed by your <laughs> thorough diligence. Two hours of research on you, bro. I got oh, you. Man, I don't know if I deserve that, but thank you. Um, yeah, so I mean, the spirit of the, the post and the spirit of the specific uh, excerpt is that when you have a new currency, um, the best way to guarantee that you know it becomes real is to have it spread far and wide. So mm. it's basically an argument in addition to, hey, you just got filthy rich and you didn't really earn it. In addition, it's in your best interest to help basically guarantee that the value stays where it's at by getting more and more people interested in, in the, the mm. story, right? Because money is just a story. And you know, the more people that believe it, the more likely it will retain its value. So uh, I still believe that if, you know, we, and my, my views on, on Bitcoin and crypto have definitely evolved. Um, you know, it's been over two years and it's a, another podcast that, you know, we could, we could dive into it. Uh, I would say though that, you know, it, having a non-sovereign store of value in my mind still has a lot of merit. Mm. Uh, it seems like Bitcoin is the sort of, uh, you know, de facto non-sovereign store of value today, maybe indefinitely. Uh, I have a little bit, so I would be okay with that. Um, <laughs> you know, but as a means of exchange, I'm not sure that it, uh, you know, is, is as effective as we once thought it, it could be. And so the idea of spreading a store of value widely versus spreading a means of exchange, medium of exchange widely has slightly different, uh, I would say, characteristics. For sure. If I'm thinking about it, though, you know, the, the fact that everyone knows about gold and everyone sees gold as a store of value um, helps it retain its value. So I think the logic still holds that the more people who held a very small piece of Bitcoin, even if it was, you know, only a couple dollars, the more likely that it would actually, you know, it, I would say um, cement its, you know, uh, status as this de facto non, non-sovereign store of value. So hopefully that, I'm curious to hear if you, you know, feel the same or, or differently. Well, I'll, I'll give you my two bits. I, I, I spent three and a half hard years as a, as a founder in the cryptocurrency world. I built six applications and the seventh one was venture funded. So mm -hmm. do I believe in cryptocurrency? Do I believe in Bitcoin, the efficacy and effectiveness of it in the long run? Absolutely. And mm -hmm. I, I merely go to the 1001 of Bitcoin, which is essentially, it's a protocol. The internet I know, <laughs> but we're going to the, the binary code of it, right? It's the code. Crypt, uh, Bitcoin is a protocol. The internet's a protocol. The internet continues to expand as a protocol used, decentralized, and Bitcoin will continue to expand ad infinitum, in my opinion. So it is valuable and smart. For all of those listening out there, it is valuable and smart to at least own one, be part of the history of technology. So that's my opinion. I think it's going to win. What say you? Yeah, I mean, I think... Like many things, I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. um, Fair enough. But I think that it would be uh, prudent as someone who looks at the entire asset universe and looks at it from an investment management discipline not to diversify into an uncorrelated, you know, highly speculative asset class. Um, in some ways that's what venture capital is, but in other ways it's, it is correlated, but, um, yeah, I would say, you know, put a little bit in, don't think about it, just leave it there. And, you know, if you lose it, you lose it, but if you don't, uh, it's probably going to be worth a lot more than it is today. Uh, so yeah, my advice is put a little in and just ride the wave. Absolutely. As the, as the Bitcoiners would say, hodl it and hodl yeah. it strong. Well, Max Marine, thanks so much for this opportunity and this great conversation. I'm going to give you the last word. Where can people all over the world find more information about you as well as your venture fund? Yeah, so, you know, usually VCs will say you can find me at my Twitter handle, but I'm not tweeting that much these days. That might change in the next... Uh, like three tweets. Yeah, yeah, I haven't really been using that platform uh, the way that VCs tend to tend to use it. So maybe that's that's on me. Um, you know, I think the the best place to reach me is Max at Lul VC. Um, that's uh, that's my email address. Uh, also on LinkedIn. You know, I'm very active on LinkedIn as well. So 
uh, Max Marina on, on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the word. And I really appreciate the, the openness, the, the questions, the research, the vibe. I think what you're doing is, is great. And the fact you're doing it from your, your garage is even, even better. So live in the startup dream. Well, Max, again, thanks so much. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Take care. Take care. True startup story time. Guys, as a founder, I'm often asked, what are my go-to tools and technology that I use as a beginner startup? Well, that's easy. One of them is Dropbox. Dropbox is the easiest way to ensure that all your files and documents are synced on all devices, whether it be mobile, your local desktop, or remote. We want to thank Dropbox for supporting vchunting.com and make sure to get your 30-day trial free at dropbox.com business. Wow, wow, wow. Well, wasn't that a fun interview with Max Marine of Lul Ventures, which is L-O-O-L Ventures. Man, what a cool guy. You know, I really enjoyed, I really, really enjoyed doing research on Max Marine, not only watching his shirtless rap videos about venture capital, but the fact that he, he's, <laughs> I can't, I'm sorry, guys. I. Something just flashed through my mind. Uh, there's a scene in his uh, Startup Nation where he has a sh his shirt off. Um, and he's and actually, there's a guy behind him. Uh, I think he's a local yokel who has his shirt off and he's moving like a worm. <sighs> Guys, I don't know why that crept up in my mind, but that's exactly what I'm thinking about right now. The guy, the shirtless dude, the skinny shirtless dude in the back. Uh, doing uh, some wormy type of dance. But guys, I hope you enjoyed this conversation I had with Max Breen. I loved his story. I loved his story of, of, of talking to his boss at the time over in America, saying, hey, I want to move over to Israel after he, he traveled there and he had some experiences there. And then going out, doing it, going to a different country, trying something new. I think he's, he said that he was uh, teaching English there at, at, at the beginning, but then began getting plugged in to the startup world. Yeah, maybe ladies had something to do with it. Could you blame a brother for, for that, uh, especially in your early to mid twenties? Can't blame a brother for that. But I really appreciate so much about Max and, and his, his perspective. And let me talk about this. You see, I believe, and this is just this is just me, and this is a retrospective, guys, of course, so I get to talk about whatever I want. But I believe the content generation space has missed venture capital. Or let's put it this way, venture capital has missed the content generation opportunity. Yes, he uh, talked about um, uh, several several companies like Andreessen, like Redpoint, like um, uh, these, these types of companies are pushing out content. These types of VC venture funds are pushing out content, but the vast majority of venture capitalists aren't. They think Twitter is enough. They think uh, LinkedIn's enough. It's not. If you want to have, if you really want to have, in my opinion, now this is just my opinion, but if you really want to have a competitive advantage as a venture capitalist in the future, you should be on video. Podcasts don't work. They don't, they don't cut it. Yeah, they're in vogue. They're cool. But we're not the younger generation. The younger generation of individuals, kids who are 9, 10, 11, and 12 right now are not going to be listening to podcasts about venture capital. They're not going to try to be fi fi re uh, listening to podcasts to try to find a venture capital fund that they want to invest with. They're going to go to video first, which is why in many ways I'm doing this and why in many ways I'm so happy about Max and his desire, his challenge to do rap videos on about venture capital. It's awesome. It's a huge differentiating factor. And I hope that you guys saw that here. So if you're listening and you're an entrepreneur and you're a founder looking for venture capital, you should look for venture capital firms that are providing content, daily content, value add, not just assuming that the deals are going to come to them. It's going to be part of the new world in the future. And I think Max is very much ahead of the curve here. He's known as the VC rapper, venture capitalist rapper, and he's going to continue to be known for that, his brand, beyond Lowell Ventures, if he decides to leave in, in the future, he's gonna have something that is attached to him that is, shows, shows social proof of who he is. This is a big deal. We lack a lot of social proof. That's a key idea here. We lack a ton of social proof in the venture capital world. And those that are doing content best, those that are doing content best, those are the ones that are going to win. You know, what else? 
Tel Aviv, Israel startups. I want to add some other questions here that we didn't get to, but that's okay about the startup culture there. And we can bring Max on again another time and talk about it. But uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. I'm, I'm really, it's, it's one of those feelings that I'm getting right now during this retrospective around, I, I really, I'm really rooting for Max. I'm really rooting for Max Marine because I, he's the type of guy that uh, I can see succeeding in the venture capital game if he sticks in it for the long haul because he's willing to brush the ego aside. He's willing to put his ego on the shelf and say, hey, this is just part of my personality. Take it or leave it. I'm willing to do these things. It might seem embarrassing to most, but you know what? He's willing to do it and he's going to make a name for himself doing it. I know there's a lot of stuff, other stuff I could talk about in my conversation, but that's why you guys... That's why you guys should watch the whole thing so you don't have to hear just this retrospective. If you want more information on Max Marine and this full conversation and the field notes, feel free to go over to vchunting.com slash Max Marine. Guys, this is a fun conversation. I can't wait to write it up and push it out to you guys. We have some great interviews coming up this weekend, and I'll see you guys next time.